Welcome everyone to this webinar on pandemic effects and library directions, which we're very happy to organise with our friends at OCLC. My name is Stephen Weibar, I'm Director for Policy and Advocacy at IFLA. And I'm aware that especially now, we're at a time where it's incredibly important to have people, have people who put in the effort to bring together evidence, to bring together information, to present ideas, and to help us really have debates to understand how to deal with the uncertainty that we're facing, how to structure our plans, how to look to the future. We've got two really great examples of this work from these ROCLC colleagues today, looking at the results of the new model library project, bringing together the insights from 29 library leaders around the world, looking at both the effects of the pandemic today and directions of the future, as well as talking about the results of the Realm project, which has been a, a fantastic drive to put together science-based information to help cultural heritage institutions navigate the uncertainty of the pandemic, as well as preparing for the future. We have two colleagues who are here, to, who are here to, with us today to explain, to talk about these. First of all, we have Lynn Silipini Conway, who is the Director of Library Trends and User Research at OCLC Research. She has numerous publications and is an international speaker, including tonight, and has co-authored Basic Research Methods for Libraries, the fourth and fifth editions, as well as Research Methods in Library and Information Science, the sixth and seventh editions. We also have Sharon Streams, who is the Executive Director of Web Junction, a project of OCLC research that has provided free continuing education and professional development for library staff since 2003. So next year will be a big anniversary. Web Junction also designs projects and delivers transformational programs that connect public library services, public library services to communities, needs such as lifelong learning, health well-being, and economic uh, and economic success. So with that, I'm going to hand straight over to Lynn in order to, to lead us off. I will only say if you have questions, please do ask them using the questions and answers tab. And I look forward both to our speakers, to Lynn, to Sharon, and to your questions when they come in. So over to you, Lynn. Okay, thank you, Stephen, and thank you for everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here one minute. Um, I think we're set. I hope you can all see the screen now. No? Um, I'll try again. I'm not sure if you're seeing it. If you're not seeing the screen, will you let me know in chat? Um, but hopefully you are. And so I am talking today about a project that we've called a new model library. And that is something that you heard Stephen talk about. And first of all, before I begin, we need, I, I really- Sorry, need, Lynn, just yeah. checking in. It looks like we're not seeing it. Okay, I will try again. Thanks, Sharon. Mm -hmm. um, let's try again. I'm going to try something different. I'm going to get out and come back with it. All right. Yes, yes. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Yes. How's that? Is that better? Not yet. Hmm. It worked. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we, we know we've seen it before. <laughs> so, uh, oh, okay. We're seeing a screen, but just not your presentation. Not the one you want to yeah, you're see. Seeing, you're, we're seeing the Zoom um, browser. Okay, let me try again here. I'll try one more time. How's that? Yes, you did it. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the help. So this is our research team. And I want to thank these colleagues um, because it did take a village to actually 
conduct this, this research. And so what we wanted to know was basically the challenges and the opportunities that came about from the pandemic and how will our current YBRA model change? And what that means is we wanted to know what happens what, or what is going to happen with this whole essence of what libraries are and how they function. And we not only wanted to focus on the challenges and, and the opportunities during the pandemic, but more importantly, what might emerge um, from a, as a result of these social and economic changes that were brought about or accelerated by the pandemic. So as you can see from this slide, we have um, 29 leaders from around the world who we interviewed. So we conducted 29 individual interviews and we had specific questions um, for all of these individuals. We did background work to learn how um, they were addressing the pandemic, what was happening within their um, regions, within their local cities and towns, and within their institutions. And so 72% of the library leaders were from academic libraries. And when we break that down, they were from 62% uh, were from four year academic and research libraries, 10% from two year research, um, two year libraries or community colleges, technical colleges, and then 28% from public and national libraries. And so the library leaders in these different regions throughout the world were also at different stages within the pandemic. And so that's something that we needed to remember. However, when we talked to them, they had very similar experiences and also their visions of transformation um, were somewhat similar. So we could collect these and put them into three different library experiences. And as you see, the first one is um, work experiences. And that had to do with st the staff well-being, flexible work environments, and the organizational structure. And then we have the collections experiences. And these are collections both in the digital and virtual environment, as well as the physical collections. And then the engagement experiences, again, looking at both virtual and in-person. And again, some accelerated changes were all, already underway. They were, it was, they were constantly changing. Within these work experience areas, we heard the library leaders talk about these areas of impact and they emerged in their vision for this new model library. And it's not one vision, but each individual library, library leader had a vision. Some were very similar, but they were dependent upon their communities. And so agility is taking quick and innovative action in response to changing circumstances and expectations of the community. Collaboration was working with stakeholders to lead change within libraries, institutions, and communities. Virtualization was expanding online library experiences for staff and the community. And space was finding new ways to engage with the physical library. Now within work experiences, we'll, I will focus on the agility and collaboration. And so there were several things that came out of our discussions. One was this embracing flexible work. And so individuals, some individuals were working remotely. Sometimes some were working within the physical library. 
And so people had to be flexible, flexible about their hours, their work arrangements. All, the next one was foster well-being in the work environment. And this was very important when you think about the, all the changes that everyone was going through and continues to go through. And so staff well-being was also very important training for the future because that individuals had to think of different ways of working. We had library leaders had to think about how to retool and give this give opportunities for the library staff to retool and try different types of jobs and responsibilities within the library. The traditional divisions of labor um, were challenged at this time and, and still are. Some staff were overloaded. Others had to work in different areas um, within the community or within the library. And this went across all types of libraries. So public, academic, and national. Now, this is a quote from a library leader in the Netherlands from a, a, a research university. And not everyone thrives from working remotely. And so what was really important is how will this impact the people, the staff? Um, how will it impact the library's functions? You know, we need to start thinking about different ways of working, how will this? How did this influence the staff's connection to each other? And one thing that we have to remember is staff should have equal opportunities. Um, so all staff should have this regardless of their work arrangements. And that's something we, we heard a lot. Some individuals were working remotely, yet they did not have laptops at home or maybe their internet connectivity um, was not good. So these are all things that did not come up when individuals were working all in one physical space. Now, this is a quote from a library leader in Australia from a research university. And there were many changes and uncertainties in 2020, and some are continuing today. And the pandemic is just layered on all of these other events. And so the leaders needed to find ways to communicate and model behaviors for this staff. However, this is steeped in the culture of the library and the parent organization. And I really like this quote, whenever she is saying that change is hard for a lot of people. We will feel unsafe, scared and nervous for years. We had fires and, and smoke, hailstorms, rain and water damage in three libraries, followed by the pandemic. Um, so we, we have to go and have a break. You need to have a process that recognizes that we're really needing to recoup in a different way to build that internal resilience. This is someone from a four-year college in Greece, and she's talking about the, this learning, this continuing education. You know, we started learning like crazy, all of us, like, and, you know, getting online tutorials, reading the Chronicle of Higher Ed, looking at what everybody else is doing and try to bring, bring in the good things. And also reassure people that this is everywhere. We're in this together. It's just not us. So it's this importance of continuing to prioritize learning opportunities, um, talk about staff job sharing. Uh, in this way, people need to retool, we need to really communicate and collaborate. This from a four-year college library leader in the U.S. And this individual is talking about the collaboration and really relating to the needs of the community. Um, some things that we heard were like, integrating reference and information literacy instruction, this cross-training so that there wasn't just one individual 
who needed to, to be working on the instruction, but maybe several. And to align the structures to the institution's mission. And that has come up a lot about really meeting the mission and goals of the parent organization within all of these changes. Now you'll see with the collections experience, I will talk about collaboration, virtualization, and, and again, agility. Um, we library leaders had to acquire digital and open content strategically. Uh, we, they really need to create new connections to physical collections and to prioritize resources that close the digital divide. Um, the digital divide has always been present, but the pandemic really brought this to the forefront even more so. And this is a quote from a public, an urban public library leader in Canada, and really talking about the seamlessness um, of getting to the library services, not having to go through all of these firewalls and passwords. And so the what we heard is the short and long-term goals for library leaders is to continue negotiating with publishers um, to get um, more open access and more um, ease of use and access. And also collab more collaboration with consortia. Again, that partnership collaboration. And this isn't, wasn't just true of public libraries, but the academic libraries uh, uh, as well. In the academic libraries, we heard about the seamless access with the integration into the learning management systems. We also heard about this need for open content and, um, and also open access. A library leader in Spain from a research university and talking about the budget and thinking of how we're gonna fund and invest our funds in both print and digital collections. And there's this vision of services and policies changing. And what happened during the pandemic, as we all know, you know there was the pickup and delivery of materials. There was even one school library in the US where they delivered materials to the students at their homes via drones. And it's not an, an, an either or situation. We have to make room for both this physical and digital content. Uh, they, there were a lot, there's a lot of talk about the new policies and workflows for digital content, especially special collections. And also, also this user-centered collection policy, looking at community expectations and needs. This is a quote from a research um, university library leader in Hong Kong, and talking about this move toward closing the digital divide and the importance of calling out misinformation and disinformation um, in this larger agenda. Next are the engagement experiences. And I'll talk about um, space and virtualization and collaboration. And collaboration is this partnership with a, with a purpose. And so there's this high, we will lead with a hybrid approach. Um, invite engagement in physical spaces. And, and again, partner with a purpose. This is from a four-year university library leader in Canada talking about the benefits of um, virtual engagement and also seeking to address those who were left out of these physical spaces. And right now, I don't know about all of you, but I'm feeling this need for that physical presence as well, to be in a space with, with colleagues. Uh, to talk, to share ideas, uh, besides in this virtual environment. And they do complement one another. We just have to work on how we work these two together. 
Also, this partnering with other libraries it can also be very helpful for the communities and personalizing the needs of your academic or, pu or public library community. This from a two-year college, sometimes called a technical college in the US, to treat space as an offering. And there's no predetermined use of space. It's dependent, again, upon the community needs. And we need to think and be very inclusive and equitable uh, with spaces, especially thinking of the community's expectations and needs. This is an urban public library leader in Canada. And talking about this collaboration with the food banks and uh, some, some libraries were actually putting materials, as you can see, um, children's books in the food bank hampers. We heard other library staff going to homeless shelters and taking reading materials and videos, different things. And academic departments were, academic libraries were working with other departments, like their IT departments, working with faculty, working with student services, all working towards providing students with experiences in their learning approaches and also for them to succeed in college. This um, more engaged partnerships also um, highlight collaboration for enhancing community engagement experiences. So there is no universal right answer to how to move forward or to a vision for a new model library. This is based on the local and institutional mission goals and needs. Also, our, we all know that our community and stakeholder needs are constantly changing. And so that's where the agility, collaboration, virtualization, and space will continue to be very important for these changes and also to continue these conversations. So moving forward, we need to be rethinking organizational structures, change these traditional work arrangements, create hybrid models for work collections and engagement, consider inequity of access when migrating to digital, plan for the adoption of emerging technologies and partner and cooperate with a purpose. We really ask that you reflect on your own experiences and discuss with staff and external colleagues some of these things. We have a learner guide that is available and it is a companion to the um, new model library briefing and it will help you with some of these discussions. So we encourage you to actually use these resources. I think Sharon has put them in the chat. And if um, you can find all of this information on the website that's on this this um, screen. So what's next? We wanna continue discussion groups. We wanna to, to continue webinars. And we plan to conduct more focus group interviews to find out how individuals are moving toward a, a vision of a new model library. I, I'd like to thank you. And um, I will turn this over to Sharon. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much. I get to do the screen sharing now. So I um, should be in that mode now. Thank you so much. Um, so this is a really nice uh, companion and jumping off place from what Lynn was talking about to talk about the Realm Project work, where Realm stands for Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums. And this has been a, a project that started back in early 2020 
And the origin story behind this is the Institute of Museum and Library Services, or IMLS, which is a US government agency that provides funding to libraries and museums, hosted a webinar uh, with staff from the US Centers for Disease Control as guest presenters back in March 2020 for the library and museum community. And that webinar left a lot of open questions about how to deal with the millions of circulating library collection items sitting in people's homes as the first wave of the COVID uh, pandemic was hitting the US and other countries. And likewise, museums, which have a business model that relies heavily on people coming to their spaces, um, buying tickets to come there, well, museums were gravely concerned about how they could operate safely. So this led to IMLS initiating a partnership between OCLC, um, where Lynn and I are from, which is a global library technology and research company, and Battelle, which is a scientific research and development company, bringing us together to provide science-based information to the field to help decision-making through the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, along with between these three partner organizations, it was essential that we draw upon the real world, real time experiences of libraries, archives, museum leaders and staff. So um, the project has had an executive project steering committee, an operations working group and a scientific working group, group that includes um, not just um, institutional members, but also member associations such as IFLA um, in those groups. The project uh, began its work in April of 2020 and is continuing still uh, at least through September of this year. And we've had um, several main areas of activity. One is to review and summarize relevant scientific research emerging around SARS COVID-2 and COVID-19 um, that's um, that would be useful for libraries, archives, and museums to, as I said, engage continually with representatives from these institutions to understand what their needs, their experiences, and respond accordingly. Also to design and conduct laboratory testing and publish the findings and create toolkit resources to aid decision-making produce other publications, webinar presentations like this to um, distribute information and knowledge as, we've, as we gather it. And, um, and then other ways, collect, continually find ways to gather uh, people from the field together and also from, from experts outside the field to share knowledge and think about what we've learned throughout this pandemic that can help us all um, build resiliency going forward. So a couple things is that we, as I mentioned, the Realm project is providing science-based evidence and research findings on uh, SARS that uh, relates to um, library archives and museum uh, operations. Um, but we also know that how that is, how that information is uh, digested and interpreted and adapted for a local context is um, a big part of the equation. So just in the, in the US, each state has developed its own policies and many communities within each state have also customized their policies. So it's been really important for local institutions to make the decisions in that context. The, also, there's been a, a, an enormously fast change, uh, pace of change and new information has been brisk throughout the pandemic and this project. So we, issue regular updates from the project and we post this to 
the Realm Websites Happening Now section and also send out those briefings through a quite a large mailing list. So for anyone who is watching the recording of this presentation in the future, we encourage you to visit the website to get the latest information. So speaking of rapid pace of change, um, I wanted to talk about one of the more challenging aspects of the pandemic for cultural institutions around the world. And that is the need to continually revisit and adapt policies and services in, re in response to what has been a very fluid situation. From how to lead staff and the public to best practices for operating safely cultural heritage institutes have faced a range of new and novel issues over these past two years. So part of the Realm project has included capturing these challenges and sharing some of the approaches used by leaders in libraries, archives, and museums, as well as those outside the field. We've realized that institutions, other businesses, other industries that have facing similar challenges, we can learn from them as well. One resource that came out um, in, the, in September of 2020 has proven to be really helpful. And this is an article that was published in the British Medical Journal um, by researchers in the UK. And it did a really wonderful job of explaining the anxiety and confusion people they knew people would feel about making decisions during a pandemic. They're sort of experts at what a pandemic looks like. And so they could encapsulate it in these sort of five areas of, of uh, unique factors of pandemic decision-making. And it was really helpful to have this articulated at the outset of the pandemic, as I expect most everyone in the room will recognize how much their decision-making has had to change due to these unavoidable issues that come with um, such a situation. Um, unavoidable issues such as dealing with flawed or incomplete data, not having concrete answers to our questions, and also the wide variation in how different people interpret the same data. And the differences between research coming out of a lab and the research coming out of watching what's happening in the real world. So this has required all of us to adapt to new ways of making and communicating decisions without all the knowledge that we'd really like to have. We've had to make decisions quickly, be clear about what we don't know yet, and be prepared to make changes in our decisions as new information comes to light. I also want to acknowledge that one of the things that has come along with all of that decision making is decision fatigue. We are all tired of having to decide what to do and how to respond. And this is, you know, compounding in both our professional and personal lives. So it's important to acknowledge that challenge in ourselves and those around us. Other changes that we've seen uh, across libraries, archives, and museums are a range of service and policies changes. You heard Lynn talk about this from the new model research, new model library research, and the Realm Project has observed similar trends in our discussions with um, representatives from the field. You know, certainly from a staffing perspective, as people started working from home or wearing masks was in the building and social distancing, we've seen so many twists and turns around that. Um, but we've had, um, we've heard from libraries, um, much more reliance on curbside pickup and um, spending more effort on digitizing services and access to collections and then taking really popular in-person programs such as story time at the library and finding ways to do that online. For museums, also museums who um, could not have as many visitors in their physical space, uh, found ways, um, ingenious ways to do more online programming to connect to schools and, um, and community members. 
More recently, we're seeing these institutions being um, community hubs for vaccine clinics or a place to get access to COVID testing kits. Now, we also heard about strategic plans. You know, many institutions have their three or five or even 10 year strategic plan. And with this very um, different change in the, in the current situation, some institutions found they needed to put their strategic plan on hold or sort of throw it out. Um, but others took advantage of what was a bad situation, but seeing how they might move ahead with strategic initiatives. Um, nevertheless. And we have this great example from one of the members of our scientific working group. Um, this is Dr. Frederick Bertley, who heads the Center of Science and Technology, or COSI, in Columbus, Ohio. And an interview that we had with Dr. Bertley, he explained that they had just done a strategic planning exercise in January of 2020. And one of the questions that they considered was, what would a science museum be if it didn't have bricks and mortar? That is, it didn't have a physical building. And they acknowledged that an increasing online presence should be part of that vision. And um, that can be really a, a, quite a challenge um, because uh, the space can be very competitive. There's a lot of, of things trying to grab our attention online, of course. So they knew that it would need to lean on building community, partnerships, relationships, and demonstrating impact. So the staff started to outline what some of these activities and services would look like. And um, actually, with the way things turned out when they had um, to limit access to their physical space, they went ahead and found ways that they could just start moving forward with their online services. So that video with Dr. Bertley is part of a series of articles and videos called Perspectives from the Field that feature conversations with leaders in US institutions about their experiences, what they've learned, the changes that they've made to their policies and services, and what they're looking to on the horizon. So we, we encourage you to check those out. I would say that a common denominator among across all these videos is examples of where these leaders started with the strengths. They looked at what they uniquely had for their community, what they were good at, what they knew, and started from there and started to build from there. And I think that gave them the them and their staff more confidence to try new things during this difficult time. So with those examples, perhaps you have some of your own. If you think, I'm curious to hear any changes that you've implemented over this period of time that you that now your institution is saying, you know what, we just might keep doing that um, regardless of what happens with the pandemic. So I invite you to add into the chat any um, examples uh, about changes that you plan to keep, that you made, that you plan to keep. And meanwhile, I think I will just keep moving on to talk about the research around COVID-19. So this first, you know, what I was just talking about before this, I think that you see that a, a lot of emphasis is really on the people, you know, it's about leading staff and people interacting, you know, interacting with your community, responding in new ways, deciding in new ways, um, but certainly a core piece of the Realm project has been science research about the virus. Um, so I'll give a little up, uh, recap of what came out of that. So um, that, that review of the science began back in April, 2020. And that work has involved working with Battelle's research scientists and their library, as well as the project's scientific working group members to track the emerging research across 
a wide array of disciplines such as microbiology, epidemiology, immunology, biochemistry, physics, data science, social psychology, public health. Each of those areas have studied a different part of the problem and offered findings that unfortunately didn't always neatly, always fit neatly together. But in the first two phases of the project, we focused our attention on three questions, which are the ones on the slide here, which is how could, might the virus spread through general operations of cultural institutions? and how effective are various prevention and decontamination tactics. And then um, because the concern about all of the materials that are circulated and, and touched in these spaces um, and through circulating libraries, we wanted to know um, whether the virus um, remains active and for how long on such materials. So we conduct with working with Battelle Research Lab, we conducted eight studies of um, a whole variety of materials and those results were released in, in uh, lab reports over the course of uh, fall, second half of 2020 through um, I think January of 2021. This slide is just a nice slap, uh, snapshot of the overall results looking around different materials, the, the length of time that the virus remains um, active and alive on those surfaces in laboratory conditions. Um, this, this whole research, the whole body of research has been accepted to the peer reviewed Journal of Applied Microbiology and will be published as an open access research in the very near future. Once, uh, once the variants of the, so that all that laboratory research was conducted using the original wild type version of the SARS COVID, COVID virus. And of course, we know um, as 2021 and now into 22, we've had two in particular, two significant variants of the virus uh, come through. And that uh, led to, um, more questions, more research questions. Um, so, you know, we weren't going to do more laboratory results, but we wanted to know what are the impact of the variants on these, on the protocols and the interventions that had been in place. Do we need to do anything differently than what we were doing before? Also, when you introduce vaccine vaccines into the, the equation where we have a, um, a combination of vaccinated and unvaccinated staff in public, and we have a combination of new protocols, laws, and restrictions for the public within cities and states and countries. Um, what does this mean, again, for decisions that libraries, archives, and museums can make to keep their operations and services uh, going? So uh, Battelle produced a series of additional research briefings on what we became referred to as the three Vs, so on vaccines, variants, and ventilation. And this is basically um, scanning the research that has been published across the scientific community from around the world and finding those studies that most, that seem to most relate to the operational settings and concerns of, of our community. Throughout this research, we've still had a few key uh, known unknowns for which there is still no conclusive answer. So even after all this time and considerable research and costs, um, and again, especially as those variants introduce, introduce greater complexity to these questions. So um, we, uh, while we've all wished for some clear and consistent answers during the pandemic, we've come to terms with the fact that that's not how science works. Rather, there's been an accumulation of evidence that when pulled together, tells a story about COVID-19, 
around which a growing majority of researchers have coalesced. As we've seen through our literature research and as has been reflected in communications from the US Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization, there's general agreement that the virus travels easily through the air, both through large respiratory droplets, through small aeros aerosolized particles, and that the transmission of materials and surface is a less common source of COVID-19 infection. There's also evidence that the transmission via body fluids, including sewage pipes, may be possible. While there's still under these unanswered questions about transmission and also about the infection, infectious dose of SARS-CoV-2, there is much greater understanding and consensus in the science community about how to reduce the risk of transmission when not vaccinated. So wearing a mask as guided, maintaining physical distance from others, washing your hands and choosing settings that offer plenty of fresh air and sunlight. What we've found, and this has been, I think a, a great relief to our, our resource constrained community is that we typically don't need expensive new gadgets for any of this. Um, it's really about building new personal, social, and work habits. The tactics uh, showing efficacy include hand washing and hand sanitizing, um, wearing masks, and uh, for also um, cleaning, there's certain disinfectants to clean surfaces um, when you are dealing with a, a contaminated surface. Um, of course, when the discussion around uh, disinfectants and cleaning was more of a was a active concern back in uh, 2020, um, there was great caution, in particular from the archivist uh, community, to make sure that people are very careful about what they use on sensitive collection items. So. Um, whenever possible, the idea of just leave it alone, just let it just just let it sit there for an hour or, or more. Um, that was always, um, and just letting it naturally attenuate, that's always been the preferred method. I, th I think um, there's also been issues about finding the balance between pragmatic cleaning and also over cleaning. Um, that really has no effect in reducing the risk of transmission, but can also contribute to not just um, a high expense of, of cleaning products, but also harmful effects to people, objects, and the environment. Now, from our conversations with people who work in libraries, archives, and museums, we still mostly hear of institutions who cannot trace COVID-19 cases among staff or visitors back to their own operational policies and procedures. And we also frequently hear of community members who express their gratitude to their local institutions for putting health and safety first and who are appreciative of the services and programs provided during the pandemic, even those that had been adapted from in-person to virtual. So finally, I wanted to just uh, point you to the resource area of, of um, the Realm project and the website. I need to click, yep, to get the list up there. Um, so there's a whole section of toolkit resources that have a, a variety of different um, things that you can check out. One, again, are those uh, videos with leaders so you can just hear straight, this is what we've been doing and this is what happened um, from, from them. But we've also pulled together some checklists um, and some uh, considerations, so sort of decision-making um, workflows that you can use for uh, some of the questions that have come up around operations and facilities management. Also, we've um, ha done a collection where we've looked at what other institutions or sectors or businesses or industries or associations or experts have pulled together um, that can be 
go-to resources around some of the the topics that come up with being uh, with navigating a pandemic, such as how to uh, assess risk, how to manage traumatized staff and members of the public, how to work with volunteers um, under these situations, um, and then just ideas for uh, pivoting to virtual, how uh, examples, how others have done that. We also uh, have uh, to have um, key initiatives to highlight that are from organizations that are part of the Realm project that are working to strengthen access to accurate information about vaccines and to increase vaccine confidence. Um, libraries and museums are often seen as trusted institutions within their community. So this is one way to leverage our strengths to serve the greater good. When we look at the international rates of vaccination and uh, from on this map, which is just from a couple days ago, um, we see that there's tremendous variation on the vaccine uptick throughout the world. And it's dependent on several factors, including access, um, but a, also a big um, factor is vaccine hesitancy. In particular, in the US, um, there is a, uh, a sort of a, a wall that we're hitting at where we've got about two thirds of the population who have received quote unquote, a full vaccine that is, you know, the one or two doses uh, for depending on which vaccine uh, doesn't include the booster doses, there's a lower rate for that. And vaccine vaccine hesitancy continues to be a real concerning issue in particular here in the US. And so this is an area where we see libraries and museums as trusted institutions helping to support vaccine confidence by providing access to information and sources and and uh, doing outreach to their community. And I just wanted to highlight a couple projects um, from these that are, are really, really cool and doing great work. Um, so the first one is Vaccines and Us. And this launched April 2021. And it's a partnership between the Smithsonian Institution and a range of other institutes. And the project website, which is here on the screen, it has a great range of free work resources and information. Um, and this is, uh, this, it's really about uh, kind of all different ways, you know, kind of from art and, and science and, um, and just fascinating information to connect people to the information that will help them get through their vaccine hesitancy. We learned that this is the first time the Smithsonian is hosting content on their website that's been created by other organizations uh, because, um, I mean, the Smithsonian, for those of you familiar, it is just a font of deep, deep expertise around so much, so much, so much about uh, nature and science and, and everything else that they typically don't have to go outside. But it's been really exciting to see this um, partnership um, grow. And uh, there's a just a powerful collection of information. So check that out. And the other example is an initiative that uh, IMLS is also sponsored of, and it's led by the Association for Science and Technology Centers with uh, this network of the National Libraries of Medicine and the American Alliance of Museums. And one of the core opportunities available through the project has been for cultural institutions such as libraries and museums and archives to apply for funding to help with their local community education efforts around vaccines. Uh, the organizations that I mentioned that are part of this initiative, both of those initiatives are also members of the Realm Project Steering Committee. So we've been able to share information and resources across all three project networks. Um, we, um, we're basically a network of networks. Um, and so it, it's all working towards spreading out as much information and resources to our, our global community as possible. And with that, I'm just going to wrap it up. And thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Sharon and Lynn, for those fantastic presentations. Um, we've only got three minutes left, but we do have one question. It is in Portuguese, but fortunately it was asked early enough for me to put it through the auto-translate, so I can give you a summary. Um, th there's actually four questions in there, so I think the, the really key, crucial one is, um, do you see the provision of health information becoming a, a sort of a permanent part of the role of libraries? Do you see this as being something even that gets integrated into library LIS education? And that's from Dandara Bassa to Jesus Lima. I think I can, is, I can speak for maybe the public libraries, Lynn, you might have something from the academic library. Uh, I would say yes, that, um, that public libraries are increasingly invested in healthy outcomes in their communities. They know that health is a really health, a healthy community is very important um, and for their own, <laughs> their own survivability as an institute. So they are um, much more open and um, going towards learning, not just having um, the knowledge themselves, but partnering with um, agencies and experts that they can bring into the library to help their community. So short answer, yes for public libraries. Um, and I, I think it's a little different for academic libraries and it's also um, dependent upon the community. And I know um, a, a university where I live that there are librarians who work with the um, health um, curriculum, so the faculty, and they work in that area. But I don't, at this point, I haven't seen a lot of academic libraries bringing in the public health specialists or um, any medical staff in the library. However, there's one, um, I know of one academic two-year uh, college so, or technical college where it also serves as a public library and that's something that is happening there, but it's, it's a blended model. As far as um, education for uh, library and information science professionals, uh, yes, there are um, programs that do include this and so um, it's both in a public library um, sort of um, vision and public health um, but because again our vision of the library is changing and so the education is changing as well um, there are also um, specifics for people interested in in medical libraries and so they have a, another special um, subject area, which also comes out in academic libraries. Thank you, that's excellent. I think that, that, that answers the question well. And I think also what was really interesting was the, 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 the points that you were making, Lynn, earlier about this growing role of partnerships. And, and I think hopefully in particular, partners valuing libraries, because it shouldn't always be libraries having to go out and, and sell ourselves. We do need to get to that situation where actually we are seen as the go-to place by public health authorities, by employment authorities, by other groups, seeing that working through libraries can be such an effective way of getting places. So we're at time, and it's also three o'clock in the morning for me, so I'm going to sort of call this when it ends. To end, I simply wanted to, to, to reiterate a point I made at the beginning that there are so many opinions and there are so many experiences of the pandemic out there at the moment, and it's completely impossible to go through all of them. And so it's really, really valuable to have people, to have organisations that bring these together into one place, that structure them, that provide them, feed them back to the field as, as a basis for structuring thought and for actually taking things further. And I think with the Realm project, with the, the new model library project, we've there's, these are two fantastic examples of that just really helpful service to the field as a whole. Um, I know I'm, I'm grateful for it. it. It makes my life a lot easier. I, I know it'll make makes the life of a lot of our colleagues around the world easier also. Um, I'll just give you the opportunity to say any final words you'd like to add in. I just I want to thank everyone for joining us and thank you, Stephen, for uh, burning the midnight oil. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, thank you so much. Great. 
So with that, thank you for everyone for joining. Um, we have recorded this, we'll put this up on IFLA's YouTube channel and we will include the links that have been shared in the chat in the description up there on YouTube. So if you want to watch again, if you've not managed to copy down those links, that will all be available. And of course, then please do then think about sharing the recording with colleagues who may not have been able to make it at the time we've given. But with that, thanks once again to Lynn, to Sharon, to all the colleagues at OCLC for this work. And I wish you a very good rest of the day or evening or night. Thank you very much. Nice.